All right, we have a very special episode, an episode I've been looking forward to personally for a while for selfish reasons. Mainly, I'm hoping uh, our guest, John, is going to fix my golf game. Uh, But it is John Sherman here at Practical Golf on Twitter, author of The Four Foundations of Golf. John, thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. I'm uh, interested to see where this conversation will go. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking offline a little bit, and you were telling me that – you like, I want to get into some of golf stuff. I want to get into what you're doing now, but this, this is not an overnight thing for you, what you've been doing no. <laughs> uh, as an author, as a creator, give us, give us how, you know, what did the last eight years look like to get to this point? Um, long story short, um, yeah, my, my background professionally has always been in, in sales and marketing. Uh, I'm not a writer. <laughs> it, it's funny. I, 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 people call me an author and I still don't think of myself as one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I started my career at Google a long time ago when I graduated college, got a taste of the online world and then left that. Um, and then somewhere around 2014, I believe it was, um, I just, was thinking, what what can I do online to share my expertise? And I felt like I have something to offer on golf. I've gotten to a fairly high level. So I just started writing on my blog about you know, different ideas I, I believed I had to get better and worked really hard to try and make that a business, had to figure out everything that goes into making a, a website successful, you know, SEO, becoming a better writer, coming up with ideas, social media, getting advertisers, affiliate mm-hmm. relationships, eventually e-commerce stuff, um, writing my first book in the beginning. So I, I, I made a lot of, <laughs> I assumed a lot of things that, that weren't true. I made a lot of mistakes and I just kept, as my golf advice is, is usually the same as I paid, attack, I paid attention to the feedback and kept adjusting and, and here I am. So you say you're not a writer, but you've been writing a blog for eight years and have two books. Uh, what What's the bar to be called an author? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I spoke with um, Tom Coyne, who you might know. He, he's written a lot of great golf books about his you know travels in Ireland, Scotland, across American golf courses. You know, the guy is an MFA. He's uh, book deals. <laughs> to me, that that's a tradi- that that he's an actual an author. He's sure, teaching. He, he teaches at a collegiate level. Yeah. Um, I'm a guy. I think. I think what I have is I have. I think of myself more as a coach, mm-hmm. and the the communication method I've found that's most appropriate for me is writing. Just because I I think I'm able to take complex topics and make them simple. Um, if I were to go out and write a novel, I don't think it would be very good stylistically. Um, so I, I, despite writing this massive book, I, I, I'm more think of myself as a coach than a writer. Um, but that's that's just my own thing, I guess. Yeah. Don't sell us that. Maybe you have the next like bag of vants in there, you know, who knows? I I do have an idea for a golf novel, but I I think, I think it's too cliched to be quite honest. So I'm not even going to share it here. (laughs) So so you you kind of alluded to the fact that before even your your career with Google and definitely before you became a writer, you had this history, this relationship with golf. Um, Tell Mm -hmm. us, how did you fall in love with the game? how did you come up learning it? All that sort of thing. I, I was a kid who played every sport growing up, you know, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, anything I can get my hands on. And one day I, I found a o- really old set of golf clubs in my grandmother's garage. I, I'm probably my, my late grandfather's. I never met him. Um, and I took them across the street into an abandoned schoolyard and just started smacking the ball around. And, and these were like old golf clubs, wooden shafts. They were hard to hit. And I stacked up some dead grass to essentially made a makeshift tee and I made perfect contact and watched the ball, you know, sail through the air. And I was, you know, hooked. I think everyone mm-hmm. who plays golf knows that feeling. And I put that in the book that, you know, I, I've kind of been chasing that ever since. So, you know, I became a decent junior golfer in high school, a little bit of college, uh, probably not as good as I could have been. I think I got in my own way a lot. And in my twenties, I lived in New York city, so I really couldn't play much. I wasn't enjoying it when I did play. And I guess the third act of my golf life, which is where practical golf and the book came from, is I was able, you know, when I became a father and moved out to the suburbs, I could play and practice again. And I got my game to a level where I could compete. Um, and I wanted to share what I learned along the way. And I guess my my unique proposition was I was, you know, a lot of golf is swing instruction. And, and what I wanted to offer was coaching from a from a player's perspective. So that's that's my unique angle is I'm trying to communicate to people 
from a golfer's perspective, which I didn't think that voice was really out there. Yeah. And it's such a unique, um, way of teaching, I guess, or a way of, of, of doling advice, because so much of what you talk about in the book, uh, is rooted in like, Hey, when you get to the T and you're thinking about the hole before where you bogeyed it, and now you're putting pressure on yourself, you know, very like real life situations that, uh, people like me who are, who are getting into it, or even people probably who are experienced, I'm sure face every time they hit the course. And I love when you, I think, uh, you, you do this occasionally. I love the series where kind of like on Saturdays or Sundays, you'll say, Hey, uh, Hey, em- you know, weekend warrior, you're probably going to hit some, some shots sideways. <laughs> Enjoy it. You know, I love that, that ethos that you bring. Yeah. I think, yeah, for, for people who are listening to this, who don't play golf and aren't familiar with it. Um, most of the game is about the golf swing in terms of how people want to get better. They're, they're listening to swing instructors about the golf swing, which is important, but no one talks about all the other stuff, you know, how you're conducting yourself on the course, how you're practicing, the targets you're choosing. So I just wanted to give people as much tangible information as I could and shortcut their, you know, that's what coaching is. I'm trying to offer people a more efficient path to getting better. And I just feel like those things weren't being discussed or at least not enough. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, whenever I try and give out information, I try and spell it out as clearly as possible and, and solve as many problems as possible and give, you know, tangible, actionable information because a lot of stuff in golf, I just don't think it is. I think it all sounds great, but then it kind of confuses people. Um, so I, I kind of obsess over making sure that everything I'm giving to people can be understood by a, hopefully a player of any level. And was that an intentional choice to be, you know, cause I think, I think a lot of people have ideas like this, or a lot of people have passion points that they have in their life or um, something that they even have a little bit of expertise around, but crafting a unique voice is really difficult to do uh, and crafting a unique perspective, not just regurgitating to your point, whether it be swing thoughts or whatever for you, was that, how did you go about that process? Is that just something you, you learned over trial and error or was that an intentional thing? Um, probably a little bit of both. I, I started off with some ideas when I look back on those, I, I probably deleted most of those early articles at this point, because looking back on them, they were horrible in my opinion. Um, but there were some inklings of ideas and it took me a while to do a few things, gain the expertise I needed, um, find the topics that I, I felt were resonating with my audience you know, the internet is a, is a cold, dark place. If you put something out there, it's usually pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to at least get some type of feedback. And and there were certain things I would say that were connecting with people. So I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll explore that more. And, and that just took hundreds of articles. I mean, just constantly throwing stuff out there. And eventually I kind of settled on you know, my greatest hits, my best ideas, my best problems that I solved from people listening to their questions. And ultimately that became the framework for the book. So when I set out to, you know, write the table of contents, that that actually wasn't hard for me because I had spent years thinking about these things, writing about them, sharpening, you know, my message. And you say, you, you know, how, how I communicate it differently. I think that's important too in writing or or coaching, whatever you're doing, because someone can say the same type of advice or even like a joke, for example, with a, with a comedian, you can get 10 comedians to say the same joke, but why does Chris Rock get the best laughs? Mm. It's, it's, it's the way he delivers it. And I think that rings true in writing. Like someone like James Clear, for example, I mentioned him a lot in the book. Mm Mm-hmm. He doesn't write anything new or different about habits. It's all research that's been out there. It's been in other books. But the way he organizes that information and the way he describes things actually gets people to change their habits. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really hard to do. It looks easy. It looks so simple. uh, But there's a lot of people trying to do that. Why did he stick out of the pack? And I don't think that's possible for everyone. And I've done it a little bit in my little corner. But yeah, that's... Yeah, you know, it's just constantly paying attention to what's resonating with people, um, because the first way I described, like strategy, for example, it was like, oh yeah, that that makes no, you know, that that's obvious. Why why wouldn't I do that? Whereas now I try and build the case through different statistics and stuff like that, and that that took years to kind of come up with that way of describing it. So 
So that's you know, the, the long and short of it, I guess. Yeah. And it's, it's worked. I mean, the, it's, I was telling my business partner before we got on here today, cause he's a fan of yours as well. And we were talking about how he was like, you know, you could probably boil a lot of it down to things that you've heard, take yep. your medicine or, um, yeah, drives, you know, all these things. But the fact that you wrap it in data, first of all, I'm not a data person, but to me, when you use the data, then it's like, okay, he knows what he's talking about. I should listen to him. So it gives me that kind of like piece. And then you, you bring it into the POV of the golfer. And I think that's the important part that, you know, that, that you've really crafted well and that resonates with people, um, and has allowed you to, to grow. So you, you started that, you started writing hundreds of, I'm just curious, what was your publishing cadence early on to, to be able to get hit hundreds of blog posts? Oh, I mean, I was, you know, when I first started the site, I had a lot of energy in writing. I think I've, this book has probably taken on whatever (laughs) was left out of me. Um, I would, you know, I'd be constantly thinking about ideas. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night and write articles. I was just, I was so excited about it. Like when I first started my site, I remember having dinner with my wife. Not that I wasn't unhappy in my career. It's just, I felt like a light bulb turned on to me that I didn't know, you know, had to be turned on. And I just loved, I love the, 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 I love golf. I love solving the problem of how can I make better, how can I make others better at golf? So yeah, there were times where I would try and publish two articles a week. Um, I, I wrote a book after my first year of doing the site, which did okay on Amazon. That was kind of like a quick reference guide, a combination of a lot of early blog posts. Uh, but yeah, that the writing cadence was massive. Like I was, I was writing all the time and I needed to, because again, I wasn't, you know, was I a good writer in high school and college and could I communicate clearly in a business environment? Yeah. But I hadn't written like these essays for people before. So, um, it took a lot of work to, to get, better and better. Um, but yeah, there, there was a lot of writing the first few years, like a ton. And, and that was why you were still employed full time. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah, this was a true side hustle for me. Um, and I would just, you know, when you're, when you're consumed with a topic, I think you find ways to, I, I, I think maybe my brain works a little differently than some other people, but I have like this kind of filing cabinet up here and I would just like constantly think of ideas and like refine them or tweet them out and then go back to them and then put them on, you know, write them, write them out in a blog post um, and just literally trying to find different ways to say the same thing. That That is like the essence of self-help in anything, personal finance. Like they're saying the same five things over and over and over again. Save more money than you earn. Invest it in low cost index funds. Like I love personal, I'm like a personal finance nerd. But the, the voices out there, they find great ways to get you to buy in or see see it in a different light. You're like, oh, I am going to stop going out to dinner six times a week and wasting all my money. Like the way that person explained it that one time finally got to me. Mm-hmm. And that is that is like the essence of a lot of like how to and get better content is it's not necessarily the ideas are so revelatory. Like, ever, like you said, it's like, oh, this is you know kind of hiding in plain sight. But it's like, why are you going to buy into it as the reader? That's the hard problem to, to to solve from the author's perspective, in my opinion. Yeah, and and furthermore, apply it right. Like, that, yeah, of course, be something uh, compelling about it. What about in terms of audience growth? So you're building up this library. You're working full time. Uh, how did you start to build an audience that that allowed you to eventually make this your career? So I think in terms of like you know the the marketing game online and all that, I, I followed what you know were the kind of the the quote unquote good, good advice from people who were running good online businesses. You know, I started an email list very early, um, got people to sign up for that. And I just did the habit of releasing a new article every week with an email once a week. Um, I've wasted a lot of time on Twitter, probably too much, but that helped refine my ideas. Cause you know, Twitter is, it's so difficult to get people's attention on there and you have to do it with words. Um, so the best material really does win most of the time. So that helped me sharpen up my thoughts. But yeah, I think, you know, just the the basic habit of getting the content out there, building the newsletter. I did a lot of work trying to build relationships with golf companies that I liked in the industry. And I, I sold advertising to them in the beginning. That led me kind of down the affiliate route. And then as I got more and more connections in the industry, I spent a lot of time behind closed doors 
you know, working my way through the golf industry and using my sales background. Um, and eventually that led to selling more products directly to my audience. So yeah, I think it took like three to four years for it to really catch on where I was like, okay, I've got a business here. I could really do this full time. And then the last four years have been refining that business. And I've had some ideas that have been horrible and fallen flat that I thought would work. And I let go of those really quickly. And then the ones that I saw were working, I just kept investing more time in those. And that's how I went from, you know, the side hustle to the the full-time thing. But yeah, it took a lot of, uh, there were a lot of moments where I probably, I thought I was going to quit after two years. It wasn't getting the momentum I thought it would. It, it, it's it's so hard to get people's attention online. That's mm. I always tell people that if you want to start an online business, you can have great ideas, whatever it is, e-commerce site, I mean, blogs aren't that popular anymore, but whatever you're trying to do, the hardest problem to solve is getting people in the door because there's just so much competition for people's attention. And if you can't get some type of hook and value to to, to bring them there and keep them there, like you're never going to make it. It's, it's really hard to do. Was there any single moment when you something happened, you got a new advertiser, you got new product to something that you were like, Oh, okay, this is it. I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is going to be my career. Um, I think somewhere between year three and four, like when my traffic reached, you know, in the six figures and page views is a month, that was a big thing to cross, like getting into a more like a better advertising network. Then all of a sudden companies were reaching out to me, like, can we work with you? And like some people in the industry were being like, oh, I really like what you were doing. So like I, I was starting to get some recognition for what I like, not not certainly not fame or anything, but uh, there were enough signs pointing to the fact that I was providing value and it was being received well by golfers. And fortunately, because I'm in golf, it's a great niche where there's, you know, golfers, I'm so lucky. Like if I was doing, you know, like tennis, for example, that's much harder commercially. Like what are people buying tennis shoes and a racket? Like I'm so fortunate with golf is that like, I have a lot of products I can choose from to align myself with that I believe in, and they are commercially viable for me and the companies I work with and they actually help golfers. So it's a win-win all around. Um, so that's, you know, having this niche was kind of fortuitous for me, um, from the, the business standpoint, because, yep, there's a lot of money around golf. It's not easy to get that money. People think, oh, I'm just going to go into golf and get rich, but <laughs> there's a lot of people competing for it. But um, yeah, I think once I realized like I had enough different revenue streams, I always try and diversify. Some of them have fallen flat over the years and some of them have grown. I was like, okay, I, I can I can work with this. Like something good's happening here. And I felt confident about it. What about flipping to the, to the author side? And obviously a, a, a book, creating a book is so much different than even creating a, a blog or a social media following. We just had on uh, Andrew Warner, who published the book "Stop Asking Questions," um, and Ben Fatano the week a couple of weeks before, who's a who's an indie book publisher. And I think there's this uh, there can be this stigma around creating a book, kind of what you alluded to at the beginning, right? Like if you're not Stephen King, if you're not uh, some creative genius that locks yourself away in a snowy cabin somewhere. The, the book process <laughs> might be difficult. Uh, just just knowing you and your background a little bit, talk about how you how you brought those things together for for what became um, the, the four foundations of golf. I mean, it was. I got to a point probably after five or six years where the business was doing really well, but I realized a lot of my fate was tied to selling other people's products. So online, you've got two choices. You can sell someone else's product or your own, or, or I try and do a mixture of both. And I realized that I had to have more control over my own destiny and my business. And I could only do that with my own product. Thought I could do an online course, but I had some success with an earlier book on Amazon. You know, golf, if a golf book does well, you know, it could stick around for a long time, like 20, 30, like the, the number one golf book still is Ben Hogan's book and it's decades old. So I, I knew if I could get my act together and write what I believe was my version of a, a great game improvement book, that it would kind of be this annuity for me, hopefully for the rest of my life. But actually sitting down and doing it was really hard. So like yeah. at first I was just kind of organizing all my blog posts and saying, you know, I knew my four topics, which are the four foundation, expectation management, strategy, practice, and the mental game. Now I need to fill up each of those sections with all the chapters. And that was easy for me to do. I have ideas forever because I've been writing so long. Mm -hmm. 
So I had to repurpose old blog posts and I started writing it in 2019 and I probably got halfway through and then the pandemic changed things for me because my my business kind of got hot on the e-commerce side. So I'm like, Mm. let me put this book down for a while. And then things eventually cooled down in 2021. I'm like, you got to finish this thing. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It took six months and, and honestly credit to like someone like James Clear for making things simple for me. All I did was is say, I'm going to commit to waking up every morning and writing for 30 to 90 minutes and just wow. checking off a, 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 a box on, on a habit tracker I had on my desk. And that was really hard to do. There were mornings I didn't want to do it, but I just kept doing that. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm making progress. And you know, fortunately, my wife edits for me and she's a great motivator. But as I was shipping away, I could see the end in sight. I'm like, I think you're actually going to do this thing. Um, and and just by getting so used to waking up and doing that first thing in the morning, eventually it, I just ran out of things to say and it was done. Um, but it was it was really hard. Like, I don't know if I could, maybe I'll do it again, but I feel like I can't. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We like nerding out on some of the details. So I'm I'm curious when you say 30 to 60, 30 to 90 minutes. Yep. And you're, you're writing. What does that actually mean? I mean, are you putting words on a screen or is it you're pulling, you know, bits out of a previous blog post or like what, what is the actions you're taking? In um, that? I guess it, I guess it depended on the topic. So some topics, I guess the first half of the book that I wrote was probably easier because I was kind of redoing, you know, I would take a blog post or an idea and freshen it up with stats and stuff. But then towards the end, as I got more refined with my ideas and I should note that doing my, our podcast, that, that podcast started in 2021, that helped me talking about all these ideas Mm. and getting them out kind of reinvigorated me and gave me new perspective. Um, So in terms of the actual writing process, I had a topic. So let's say, you know, you'll know this from the book, the driver practice one. That's a 10,000 chapter, uh, sorry, a 10,000 word chapter. I just actually finished recording it this morning, the audiobook version. It was 50 minutes. Yeah, it was my, my voice is probably running out at this point. But essentially that chapter was my greatest hits of all the driver info I've been giving out and learning over the past eight years. And within that, I had to break it up into mini like sub subheading chapters. Um, So a lot of it, some chapters were really hard to write like that because I had so much to say and I had to organize it. So it probably had to be edited three or four times. And other chapters like in the mental part of the book that just flowed out of me. Like I sit down, I'm going to talk about grit or something you know, that, those are the easy ones for me. They just kind of come out, but that the middle part of the book was very hard because I had to communicate it in a way that would help a golfer like you, you know, you're, you're, you're starting off in your journey of golf or a golfer who's been playing for 30 years. And how can I make sure that this information is not too complicated for you, but not too rudimentary for the other player. Um, so some of the chapters were, were really difficult to write. And I actually, didn't look forward to doing them, but again, I had my habit and I was going to stick with it. Um, and that's, that's really how I got through it because I, I genuinely wanted to stop many times. I, I can't imagine. I, I, uh, just you saying it that way. Like I, I've played with some people who have been playing for 10 or 15 years and our understanding of the game is obviously so, so different. So having to talk yep. to both of those people, um, would be tough. I'm sure it was, uh, like if you had to write about grit and you you were struggling or wanting to procrastinate, I feel like just the topic would, <laughs> <laughs> would yeah. Your it, hand. And to be quite honest, like I don't want to make it sound like it was this horrible thing, but like when I was done each day, then I would feel great. I'm like, oh, you know, you've gotten these ideas out. And I, as I was writing the book, I'm like feeling great. I'm like, this is really going to help people. Like I think I'm writing a great book here. And then you should have seen me the day I released it. It was quite the opposite. Really? Um, but it it it. it you know, that it's so hard that the reason I don't consider myself an author is because I guess like, you know, someone like Stephen King, like he just bangs out novel after novel after novel, like that, that's his profession. That that's what he does. Um, I'm interested in so many different things, uh, even yeah. on the business side that like, I, I just don't know that writing is going to be like a habit for me that sticks forever. Like I love doing podcasts now. So, um, I, I did what I had to do to motivate myself to get it done and got through it. Um, but it was also rewarding at the same time, but it just, 
it, it the energy it requires is, is really tremendous. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and I guess some people are better at it than others. It was probably harder for me than most. Stephen King probably has like a 20 handicap, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. You've mentioned the podcast a couple of times. It's, this, it's called A Sweet Spot. Um, how did that come about? Was that just a natural progression of what you were already already doing? So I, I have been friends with another golf coach. His name's Adam Young ever, pretty much ever since I started the site. If, if I was a swing instructor, I would instruct the way that he does. We both have like uh, very similar philosophies, and it's, I guess, a bit against the grain towards what else is out there in golf. Um, so we joined forces figuring it would be a good marketing tool for both of our sites, kind of cross pollinate our audiences and then get us exposed to new, new people. And it worked tremendously well. Um, and and what, what's great about that was, is now we could pick topics and we would just talk about them. I'd have to prepare for the episode. And when you talk about something for, we do 90, 120 minute episodes, um, it really hashes out more of the ideas versus writing a thousand word blog post. Mm. Um, so that was really helpful for me to get even more ways to say, you know, the, the different ways to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, how could I convince people that they needed to aim at the center of the green and take the back yardage? Well, now I've got a lot of data to support it. I've heard a million different questions from golfers. Um, I've had a back and forth with my co-host over it. So it made me, I think, more well-rounded um, as a content creator. And and to be quite honest, I enjoy doing the podcast more now than writing. Oh, cool. It's just, yeah. it, it's it's easier for me to talk about something for two hours than for me to write for two hours because that's more solitary um, and it's not conversational. Um, so I, I really do enjoy doing it. And, and to be quite honest, I don't think my, my book would have done as well as it has without the podcast, even especially for a marketing channel as well. Yeah, that's awesome because I, I think um, we're very pro podcast here, obviously, uh, but <laughs> I think it allows you to continually, you know, Andrew Warner, when he was on the show, he talked about sometimes losing or getting distance between the problem and the solution he was trying to teach. It's hard to always yep. remind yourself what the problem is, but when you're having those conversations, you're, you're interacting with your audience, you can't forget the problem because they're, they're bringing it in front of your face at, at all times or your, your co-host is in this case. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and in terms of it, it's when we started the podcast, I got such a stronger response of people like DMing me and emailing me being like, Oh my God, this show is like really helping me. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, I, I got some of that from my writing, but it seemed like the podcast kind of five or 10 X that. Um, and I'm not someone, I mean, I hate to admit this. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts myself. And that's probably why I was so resistant to starting one for so long. Um, but yeah, it was really one of the best things um, I've ever done for my business and the book and everything and, and refining my ideas. So yeah, I'm, again, it, 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 there's, the problem is how do you stand out? You know, cause mm -hmm. there's so much, you know, <laughs> we, we kind of started, I started my golf website when blogging was kind of dying. <laughs> I was one of the last like websites. And, and then I was like, do I really want to start a golf podcast when there's 500 other ones? <laughs> um, but it really doesn't matter. It's never, you know, there's always that advice. It's never too late to start. Yeah. It's right. If you, if you do something, you know, that provides value to people and, and you have ways of, of promoting it and getting it in front of them, like, yes, there are ways to stand out no matter how saturated anything is. Yeah. Yeah. It's for some reason we, we put that pressure on ourselves when it comes to content, but nobody asks if there's like enough grocery stores or should you open another, uh, you know, subway or whatever. Like we just, assume yeah, they're, they're all, I, I, I always view it as it's not a zero sum game. Right. You know, a, a lot of people can win at the same time and there's always an opportunity for a different voice, a different angle. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I guess there's a number of ways you can use it. Some people make content just to kind of, you know, be like a, a nice thing to have for their business. For me, it, it is my business. Um, so that there's all different, you know, reasons why you're doing it. So yeah, there, it, it's, but yeah, when people interact with you and, and, and the podcasting forms a deeper relationship with people too. Um, and I think the book has done that when they could really immerse themselves in a topic and, and you're the person like guiding them through this it forms a much deeper relationship than I had with people when I was writing, you know, a thousand, thousand word blog sure. posts. Um, so yeah, that's no, been great. 
Well, John, we really appreciate you spending some time with us, telling us about uh, the book, The Found- Four Foundations of Golf, uh, The uh, Sweet Spot, your podcast. Before I let you go, I have to ask you, I was talking to my business partner, Derek, right before I got on. I was like, what should I ask him? Because we're both golf. <laughs> he's, hit, he's been playing golf for a lot longer before me. And he, uh, he gave me a great idea. If you're coming up to just say a, just an average par four, can you just mm-hmm. give us a quick, uh, what's the mental checklist or how, how do you think through how you're about to play a hole? This has nothing to do with content. If you don't like content, just leave. But I have to ask because I like golf. Um, so, so the first thing, you you know, you have to step up to the sea. Like, why wouldn't I hit driver here? So driver is always the priority because so you want to advance driver. the ball as far as possible. Oh, so always assuming driver. Okay. And then, you know, a lot of this planning can be done beforehand with satellite images or apps. And you say, where's the big trouble? Is it predominantly on the left side? Is it predominantly on the right side? Great. If it is one side, I'm going to aim away from it. You know, if there's out of bounds up the right and the left is pretty benign, I'm going to aim up there. Um, So you're, you're trying to identify the big trouble. Can you aim away from it? If you cannot, then it's still, you know, driver down the middle, you know, taking a shorter club just for safety doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Or you're trying to find out, is there trouble that driver brings me to because of a distance, not a width issue? So um, is there a reason to lay back because of trouble um, that maybe at, you know, certain yards that hit with my driver, but not with my hybrid? Um, So you're trying to make that decision, club off the tee uh, and target, get that done with. And then that's an independent decision. The next shot now, which I think is far more simple, is the approach shot decision saying like, okay, where did I end up? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Am I in the fairway? Am I in the rough? Am I in a bunker? Do I need to take my medicine out of the trees? Um, So I'm trying to give people this decision rubric. And as you get closer to the green, the decisions become more and more simple. Um, But the, the main thing I always try and get people across in golf is that, this took me a long time to kind of communicate this, is that eat the every shot feels connected, but they're not. Mm -hmm. They're all independent situations that need to be evaluated separately. If you hit a bad drive, you don't change your decision because on this next shot, because you hit a bad drive. We get lured into that with our emotions and our our risk taking sometimes, but the right decision is the right decision. So I'm trying to teach people the rules and each shot is new and you have your framework, you make your decision, you go through your routine, you hit and you go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Incredibly simple, but hard to do because as you know, when you're on the course, you have all these little demons in your head and distractions telling you to do otherwise. So, um, that's the basics of what I do. And I guess, you know, the the strategy section of the book explains how to make those decisions. I I think you need to write a children's book at some point that personifies like branches hanging over that I think for some reason, they talk to me, they invite me to try to hit course. Uh, it's crazy how your emotions play into it. Even when you're just out there, no pressure, technically, uh, it's just such a difficult game, but you make it so much easier. Your book has made it easier for me. So, uh, anyone listening, please check that out. And, uh, John, we really appreciate you coming on. We'll link everything we've talked about in the show notes below and, uh, hopefully catch up again soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm.